blank coal on our minds by Hamish Henderson in a review of Professor George Pride's Scotland from 1603 to the present day. A.G.P. Taylor wrote, What will keep Scotland alive now? The law is as strong as ever. Education now brings little advantage or difference. The church still seems formidable on paper, but religion is declining everywhere as a popular cause. Perhaps the Scots will have to fall back on their history after all. I doubt if we are in quite such desperate straits as all that, but this may be no bad time, all the same, to ask how Scotch history is faring in the mid-1960s. The question is by no means merely an academic one. As a nation, we have what the Germans call ein unbewaltigte Vergangenheit, a past with which we haven't completely come to terms. In this, we are quite unlike the English who have come to terms with their history so well that they have largely forgotten it. One of the splinters lodged in the Scottish consciousness, and one which troubles every now and again, is the massacre of Glencoe. There can't be many Campbells in Scotland who do not feel a faint twinge of discomfort when Glencoe is mentioned, even though the myth of exclusive Campbell responsibility has long been exploded. It is instructive, therefore, to compare and contrast three books about this famous atrocity, one which appeared 33 years ago and a couple published within the last 12 months. John Buchan's The Massacre of Glencoe, 1933, is quite a short book. It sets the scene, delineates the principal characters, describes the background of 17th century Highland life, and moves on to the terrible denouement and its aftermath in 130 pages. Popular in the best sense, and comfortably readable at a sitting. It displays an unobtrusive, but in its own way quite formidable scholarship. 152 sources, reference notes are supplied at the end of the book, although the text itself is not interrupted by asterisks or other annotations. In technique, it is fresh and unorthodox. As a novelist, Buchan clearly felt the need for a certain amount of fictional narrative, and he prefaced his book with the following note. In this essay, in Reconstruction, I have tried to include no detail which is not a warrant from contemporary evidence, and is not a legitimate deduction from such evidence. The only liberty I have taken is now and then to steer boldly as a fact what should strictly be qualified by a probably. Buchan is quite frank, therefore, about its essay and reconstruction. Nevertheless, this method has its weaknesses. They are most apparent, these are most apparent in the interview between McKeon and Colonel Hill at the Fort of Inverlochy, Fort William, parts of which read like an entry in an amateur drama one-act play competition. I have not many ill-wishers, and the chief of them is Michaelin Moore himself. Argyle is not in town at present, which is the better for you, Sir Colin Campbell is the sheriff deputy. Ard Kinglass, Voa Campbell, is an honest man, said the chief. I'm happy to agree with you. He is also my friend, and I will write him a letter. There are also one or two exceedingly odd mistakes in Buchan's book. He makes Duncanson's order to Glen Lyon refer to the rebel, the Macdonalds of Glencoe, when the MS shows beyond a doubt the phrase should be the rebels, the Macdonalds of Glencoe. Also, he makes Hill insist on inviting McKean to a meal. Although Hill himself stated in a letter to the Earl of Tweeddale, written a few weeks after the massacre. Glencoe came to me and I advised him to haste to the sheriff and I would not let him stay so much as to drink but he turned about and went to Glengarry and let the time elapse. (coughs) The reference to Glengarry has never been satisfactorily explained. McKean cannot possibly have made the journeys to Invergarry. It took him all his time to get to Inverary by 2nd of January 1692, as he had the bad luck to be attested, arrested and detained for 24 hours at Barcaldine with, Cap- with Captain Drummond of Argyle's regiment. Can it be that Glengarry, most defiant of the unsworn Jacobite chiefs, 
was waiting near Inverlochy to get a personal report from McKeon about his interview with the governor. Or was Hill the just man lying for once? The old colonel's passing allusion to Glengarry is not the least puzzling thing in all this torturous story. But in a more recent work about the massacre, John Preble's panoramic Glencoe 1966, it is not so much as mentioned. Preble's book, although not free from serious defects, is a remarkable tour de force. The author has been at pains to consult all the manuscript and other sources he could trace, including the Argyle papers at Inverary. Never before consulted on the subject of Glencoe. His description of the trials and tribulations, as well as the positive achievements of the veteran Cromwellian Colonel Hill, in many ways the true hero of the book, is first rate. Realising that the massacre, like the Battle of Boyne, is only to be comprehended against the background of the Great Revolution and the wars of the League of Augsburg, Preble quite rightly devotes much of his book to narrating the events which led up to the first major crisis in Highland history. He also has a good chapter about the culture of a society which, like the Montenegro clan society described by Gilas, was still in its structure and values amazingly Homeric. Unfortunately, the book is not free from disfiguring errors. Detailed page references to sources are conspicuous by their absence, and the imaginative reconstructions which Buchan has attempted, also attempted, has in Preble's book absolutely run to seed. Let us look at a few specific points in detail. <clears throat> Preble's first chapter is called The Gallows Heard. On page 45, he explains this epithet as follows. Lowlanders called them Highlanders, the herd widifus, the gallows herd, and are happy to pay them to be on their way without molestation. An old Aberdeen ballad sang the general feeling. Gin ye be gentlemen, light and come in. There's meat and drink in my hall for every man. Gin ye be herd with us, ye may gang by. Gang down to the lowlands and steal horse and kai. The ballad to which Preble refers, although he does not mention the source of his quotation, is The Baron of Brackley, which is number 203 in Professor F.J. Child's English and Scottish Popular Ballads. Child gives four versions of the ballad. His A Version, Langs 1822, has the following lines. Gin ye be gentlemen, licht and come in. There's meat and drink, I ha my ha for every man. Gin ye be heard wid the fist, ye may gang by. Gin down to the lawlands and steal horse and kai. Other versions have a, a curn herd wid a fist and fifty herd wid a fist. These texts make it clear that the reavers are referred to as hired wid a fist, i.e. a mercenary cutthroats or gallows birds. In any case, herd with a fist, meaning gallows herd, is an impossible construction in Scots. Herd can mean herdsman as well as herd in the English sense, and at a stretch the phrase could mean cutthroat herdsman. However, as we have seen from reference to the older texts, this is not the case here. It seems a reasonable assumption that the phrase gallows herd, supposed to have been used by lowlanders or highlanders, exists only in Preble's fertile imagination. The irony is that on page 22 he talks about Macaulay having no Gaelic and trusting to his imagination when in doubt. In spite of this dubious origin, the emotive chapter heading The Gallows Herd stays with us at the head of every second page for nearly 70 pages. This ghost phrase is supposed to be an example of Me Run Morn and Gal, which Preble translates as the Lowlanders' great hatred. Mirun Mor Nangal. The, the hatred great of Lowlander. The, or, the ordinary reader finding this Gallic phrase in the index with four page references might imagine that it was some sort of formalised concept 
like justification by faith, or a phrase with a certain historic reverberation, like the Salic Law. It is nothing of the kind. It is one line from a poem by the Clan Ranald Bard, Alexander MacDonald, Alistair MacMagster Alistair, which was written half a century after the massacre. In this poem, Alistair says that Gaelic has survived in spite of the great ill will of the Lowlanders, and points out that it used to be the language of the Gal Baraka, the Lowland Carls themselves. <coughs> One begins to see what Preble is up to. Admittedly, there has been a lot of bilious xenophobia in Scottish history, but this has been by no means restricted to relations between Highlander and Lowlander. In 1745, an open poetess from the Scottish Gaelic Heartland referred to the Jacobite Highlanders as Prasgan and Garv Kyo, the rabble of the rough bounds. See J. L. Campbell, Highland Songs of the 45. The quartering of the Highland host on the southwest lowlands in 1678 to similar recriminations. Although Galloway had an ancient Gaelic tradition which survived on the lips of native speakers into the 17th century, Preble refers to the Highland host in the following terms. It was as if several thousand Afghan hillmen were to be billeted in Sussex. This is a striking and eminently quotable phrase. It has already been quoted several times in reviews. It is also utter balderdash. The level of material culture and comfort was not markedly higher in the Galloway of 1678 than in the lands of the Earls of Strathmore and Early, whence many of the levies came. These Perthshire Afghans didn't actually kill anyone, but they looted at will and frightened old women into a decline. I wish the same could be said of most 20th century armies quartered among subject populations. It would be tedious to list all the examples of glamour, whimsy, which make a technicolour gaudy knight of Glencoe, his pen and pale fingers, thrust from a cuff of lace, was the servant of his hatred, a living thing almost. There was a madness in the man. He was the instrument of me run more than gal. But here is an example of the sort of slip which irritates even where it amuses. On page 99 we find a reference to the Jacobite army, still sleeping below the hawks of Cromdale, Preble does not mean that they are prematurely buried. He obviously imagines, by analogy with German hawk perhaps, that hawks mean high ground. Actually, hawks are low-lying meadows. Preble draws liberally on James Phillips' epic poem, Granit, especially for the flamboyant muster role of the Highland chiefs at Dal Camera. But while obviously valuing this work as a historic document, he doesn't appear to think much of it as poetry. On page 75, he says of Philip, his enthusiasm, if not the tortured allegories of his prose, recreated a forgotten day when the grass was covered with steel and tartan, when the air was filled with the sound of pipes, and Graham of Dundee stood his horse before his army, etc. Can it be that this reference to prose is due to the fact that Preble has been working from the faithful and unpretentious prose translation of Canon Alexander Murdoch, editor and translator of the Granite, rather than from Philip's own elegant and stylish Latin hexameters? Two passages from Canon Murdoch's translation are quoted word for word by Preble. You will search Glencoe from end to end without finding a reference to the translator which is to be regretted because Murdoch was in many ways a distinguished individual. He was a fine classical scholar, an erudite Scottish liturgist. He had a flighting with Dean Ramsay on the issue of the introduction of the Scottish liturgy in his own church, and a bonny factor for Scots, Scotland's rights in common, wherever and whenever he felt they needed to be defended. <coughs> In his preface, Murdoch wrote, When I was asked to edit the Gramid, a translation was not contemplated, but only a running margin of contents and a few notes. I agreed towards the end of the last year, 1887, to make a translation which would give the English reader the matter of a book in a readable form, 
and to increase the notes so as to make one volume of the Scottish History Society's publications. He, his notes, used by Preble, bear witness to an encyclopedic historical and antiquarian knowledge of the period, while the quality of his translation as it, at its best may be judged from one splendid passage in Book 4. This describes the march of Dundee's army, which included the hundred warriors of the Glencoe Macdonalds on the first stage of the campaign which culminated in the Battle of Killiecrankie. Already squadron and battalion prepared to leave the camp, the army, brilliant with the varied weapons of the caber, moves the standard while the pipe sounds and the whole force in marching order advances into the open country. The bold Glengarry, as leader of the first line, marches in the van, accompanied by 30 horse in due order. Then the rest of the chiefs advanced, each in his own station, and followed by his own people, the Highland army, with its glitter of brass and flash of bright musket, braves the sun, and with bristly spears affrights the air as it moves forward, when at length it touched by borders. O oh, Badenoch! Its wings were extended widely over the declivities of the hills. Far off the clans were seen shining in the light of the sun. A thousand helmets glitter as many quivers resound. A thousand spears, from their points bright with golden light, reflect the rays, and the fields feel the thread of the axe-bearing gael. And the Grampians are terrible with the flaunting banners. That this, that his translation of Philip's heroic poem is not wholly prose, is perhaps shown by the fact that Hugh McDermott printed an extract from it, arranged by him as verse in the poem A Hosting of Heroes, which appeared in A Kist of Whistles, 1947. Maybe Murdoch is himself the sort of history the Scots should be concerned with, although unlike Miron Morn and Gull, he does not achieve an entry in Preble's index. Something has got badly distorted here, and we need to get it back into focus. One way we can do this is take a leaf out of Brecht's book and Neruda's and realise that Wan the Stonecutter is more interesting than the dynastic wars and disputations, and even the language wars, which blow over and around him. If the name MacDonald and Campbell exert such a perennial fascination, why not take a look, for example, at Alexander MacDonald, the 19th century miners' leader, and at John Francis Campbell of Eilly, who initiated the first major research project into Gaelic oral tradition. Likewise, the Maclean's we might devote some overdue attention to, John Maclean, the socialist thinker, man of action and martyr, to the late Dr. Callum Maclean, Campbell of Eilly's principal 20th century successor. The great gory showpieces such as Glencoe will be written about again, of course, but when they are, I hope we all have the sense to prefer a book such as Donald J. MacDonald's Slaughter Under Trust, 1965, to the glossier efforts of the romantic literature and pop historian, however well packaged. Mr. MacDonald's book is a powerful short retelling of the story. It eschews jerry-built reconstructionism of the smile on Hill's face-faded variety, but it loses nothing in readability because of this sensible self-denying ordinance. Basic source documents such as the letter from a gentleman in Edinburgh to his friend in London after the massacre and the report of the Commission of Inquiry are reprinted verbatim in a series of 15 appendices. There is no costume play posturing, but the writer has considerable powers of Ein Fulon and the narrative consequently makes a compelling effect of immediacy and verisimilitude. In this century, Scottish historiography has been climbing painfully out of an appalling morass of sentimental romantic nonsense and flighty wishful thinking. For every one book which lends it a helping hand, there are ten which seem intent on shouldering it back in again. The man that corrupted Hadleyburg, in the case of Preble's Glencoe, is time-life journalism. The use of emotive captions and chapter headings to provide colouring matter and induce an artificially pebbed up reader reaction. It is all very well to claim that in the text you provide a character study in depth of a complex personality, when under a photograph of his portrait you print the words, be earnest, be secret and sudden, be quick. In spite of all the research that has gone into this, and a truly virtuoso skill in presentation, 
Rebels Glencoe must serve as a warning. Archfully camouflaged pieces of romantic history just won't do any longer. The Scots will have to come to terms with their history if they are to survive as a nation and secure the elementary civilised right of a nation to control over its own affairs. Full version of a truncated article that appeared in The Scotsman, 25th July 1966.